I welcome you all here today as, as journalists uh, to come to this International House of the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Center. It's a big honor and, and a big uh, uh, pleasure to have you here with us to share some views on freedom of expression and human rights. Today we're going to talk about the harms of hate speech, the damage that hate speech does to the world. Let me say first that when you deal with freedom of expression, we want to first insist in the openness that freedom of expression has. The idea of limitations which freedom of expression does recognize are to be considered the exception, not the rule. The rule is the openness in which freedom of expression must be practiced. UNESCO has in its constitution in Article 1 a wonderful phrase that says that it was established as an institution to build peace in the world by facilitating the free flow of ideas and knowledge between peoples of the world. So freedom of expression is in essentially the possibility of this free flow of ideas and knowledge between all human beings and all societies in the world. And secondly, freedom of expression is at the basis of our thinking ability. We seek information to build our thoughts and our opinions and to express them. Now this happens at an individual level since our earliest ages to our last days, but it also happens as a society. A society receives information, especially from you, from the journalists, from the media, to build their political opinions, to build their decision-making process, to know who to vote for, how to criticize public policies, how to change a policy if it has to be changed, or how to challenge corruption in those holding public office if this is the case. And this allows them to express their views, to demand their rights, to express their ethical values. So this is all freedom of expression. So when we talk about limitations again, we don't want the state to intervene too much in limiting freedom of expression and much less freedom of the press. We want this to be as open as possible. I always say that freedom of expression has to be seen as a plaza public, as a public space, with a little limitations on the edges, but what's more important is the mingling of information. Now, all limitations for human rights are based on the idea of protecting other people's rights. So they're not arbitrary limitations. No state can decide what they want to limit because it's a tradition or because of their history or because it's in the political interest of those in power. No, it can only be done in reference to the protection of the rights of others. And here's where, in dealing with Article 19, we find several types of limitations. But there's an essential bottom line test that has to be had, what's called the three-part test. Number one, every limitation has to be based on the protection of a right that will be harmed if the limitation does not exist, or a right that will suffer if it's not limited, the, the exercise of freedom of expression. Number two, this, this uh, right and this uh, uh, protection of this right has to be necessary to make a limitation a reality to protect this right. So we have, first it has to be based on the, on, the, on the protection of rights, secondly it has to be necessary for the protection of, of those rights, and thirdly it has to be proportional to the exercise of that right. The proportionality comes in with the state can easily overpower itself, can use excessive power in limiting the civil rights of citizens and in this case in limiting freedom of expression. And this normally happens when there's a trend to have authoritarian type of governments. So first we must deal with this three-part test. There has, there has to be a potential harm to a, a, a human right, there has to be the necessity to limit freedom of expression to protect that right, and there has to be proportionality. Um, in, in the first case, this legal right has to be established by law, so there's a principle of legality there. We have to recognize that some other rights established by law can be affected. But then when we go to Article 19 of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, or the ICCPR, 
The ICCPR talks about three types of limitation. One, it says to protect the honor and reputation of others. This means that we just can't say anything we want to insult other people. But insult per se is not a real harm. It has to be a very serious form of insult because the, the, the state does not have an obligation to protect us from offense, but does have an obligation to protect us from harm. So I cannot make a statement of another person that will seriously harm their reputation and their honor, or that they will challenge them as a criminal or, or accuse them of, of falsely of a crime. This uh, use of false information for accusing people as a criminal then would fall into this limitation. The second limitation we have is to protect national security, public order, public morals, and public health. The public morals is for the protection of children mainly. There is a limitation on the schedule of programs or on public events. How old does a child have to be or a person have to be to be able to go into this particular event? So there are certain standards of morals for the protection of the children uh, in a society that are very important, that we must keep uh, in order to, to educate in a safe atmosphere our children. And the public health element comes from the fact that false information can generate serious harms to health. The false advertisements of a medicine that does not work, or even worse, the motivation of people to use something that may be um, the harming, that may be a venom, or that actually can provoke a, a reaction to many individuals, or to falsify information about a disease that may exist and people may not be aware of it. This mishandling of information can have a very serious effect on health in society. So this is another limitation. And the third aspect of limitations, it says that it should not fall into the apology of war, the promotion of war or violence, but especially, it says, states should prohibit, doesn't say criminalize, it says prohibit the use of messages or language that incite to hatred, hostility, and violence on the basis of race, nationality, uh, and, and religion. Now, obviously, the ICCPR was drafted in the same premises of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the same Article 19. And this came out of the result of the Second World War. So the idea of the hate speech that had been used in those times was to motivate violence on the basis of race, nationality, or religion. But we could today add other elements of hate speech that also provoke violence. Issues of gender and, and femicide, for instance, violence against, against uh, women, misogynistic messages, or violence against LGTB population that in many countries are being used even for electoral campaigns like in Uganda or in Gambia or in other countries. With political motivation, there's an incitement to violence against uh, LGTB uh, population, violating the principle of their right to choose their future and their sexual preference. And there can also be against uh, indigenous populations, uh, racial, cultural minorities, linguistic differences, and oftentimes not even a serious difference, but a boundary or a border or a frontier that divides two countries. The principle here is that all human rights are equal amongst themselves, but are universal, which means should be applied equally to all human beings. And we can make no difference of one person to another. So we can never discriminate against others on the basis of race, nationality, religion, gender, age, disability, or LGTB or any sexual option that people may have. And here's where, in order to qualify serious hate speech, there are five principles that I presented in my report on hate speech that deal with issues of violence and harm this was written after the tragic events in Oslo by Breivik uh, when, when he used violence against children to protest against migrants and, and migratory policies of his own country. And the idea, the same way that we always use the example of the Radio Mil Colin in Rwanda, how this should have been stopped in time to stop the genocide. 
Many of the prevention of language, of hate speech, are in international instruments already. The, the Convention on the Prevention of the Crime of Genocide has also included the prevention on the incitement to genocide or the optional protocol uh, to the Convention of the Rights of the Child on Trafficking of Children and Sexual Exploitation of Children also prevents the use, distribution and, and commercialization of child pornography because this is a message that has violence in itself but also incites to more violence and exploitation of children. So some of these elements are already in human rights instruments or there are elements of the use of language on women's issues like the CEDAW has in, 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 in its uh, content. But we can define these, con these characteristics in five basic elements so as not to give the state too much exercise of their powers. Number one is the intent. There has to be an intentionality to harm. It's not just relevant to make an absurd comment or, or an offensive comment. There has to be a real intention to harm. The second element is the content. It cannot be a simple phrase that I say to a person that I meet. There has to be a strong distribution, there has to be a massiveness of the message to the harm, for the harm to be provoked. So it has to be something that reach out, reaches out to society and moves social forces and, and, and provokes this harm. Thirdly, there has to be a serious harm being promoted. It must promote a serious harm. It can't, like I said, just be offense. It has to be serious harm. And serious harm is either violence or discrimination. We can't say we should fire all the people that are of a different race or a different language, or we should get rid of all the migrants and put them all in jail. This would be serious harm in, in the promotion of, of this language. Fourth, there has to be, the, the, this harm has to be imminent, the imminence of, of, of this, this harm. It's not something that can happen 20 years from now, 30 years from now. This is a real harm that can happen immediately if the message continues. What happened with, with Rwanda and the Radio Milkolin, it was inciting immediate genocide and it happened. And finally, the context. The context is obviously in a country where there is racial conflict, where there is civil strife, where there is civil war in many cases between uh, factions or between religions or between racial groups, then this language has a more severe effect and therefore should be prohibited by the state. These are the five fundamental conditions to identify real hate speech. Because otherwise the state can, I think, abuse this prohibition of hate speech and try to forbid anything. Criticism of religion, for instance, is valid in journalism. We can criticize a religion, we can write about religion. Cartoons which may seem offensive to some people, are a form of journalism with mockery, with jests. They're making fun of a figure, of an idea, of a principle. And this is a form of communication which is legitimate communication. So we, we must always beware that not everything that we find offensive or that we don't like should be banned. It has to be a very serious harm involved. And normally this very serious harm, like I said, would be either an act of violence, uh, physical or psychological violence, or discrimination. And this is when really this hate speech can make an impact. Now in journalism it's important not to reproduce the patterns and the misuse of language. Oftentimes by reporting an event, we will use the same language that was used. And I think it's important here to develop a new ethics of journalism from a human rights perspective, which everyone should handle and know. And we should report on all events, but we should not repeat the same language that offended certain sectors at the beginning and that generated harm for certain sectors. We must clean our message. And it may be still shocking, and it will be dramatic according to the reality, but it will not be with the intentionality of harming anyone. This is the principle of avoiding hate speech in the world today, which would actually help us to bring a better understanding and more peace in the world.